For my 55th birthday, my daughter took me to a restaurant. We talked about her new job and how she reached this point in her life. It was May 15, 2037. She recently got a new job as a software engineer in a large web company. While we ate, she thanked me for encouraging her and supporting her throughout her career and her studies. She said I made things easy for her. I told her to remember that just like her, I had to thank all those that had come before me. The role of women in tech and in society as a whole had reached this point in life because we both traveled the path that was already paved for us. Doors that once were shut had been now left wide open for us. Glass ceilings had been shattered by all these incredible women that came before us. But things weren't always this way. Traveling back in time, Your grandmother grew up in Alexandria. She went to a Greek school in the 1950s. She had a natural skill for maths, but she wasn't encouraged to develop it by her teachers, as it wasn't seen to be feminine enough. It was left to her father, uh, an accountant who saw the potential in her, to encourage her to further engage with the subjects she loved, despite the views of the society she was a part of. She was growing up in a time of great unrest. She faced the exodus of the Greeks, uh, due to the newly established regime of Nasser. She had to travel to Athens to a society that was no more encouraging than the one she was leaving behind. Um, apparently, educated women were not seen as good potential wives to the eligible bachelors of Athens. But that didn't hold her back. She did pursue her dream. She entered university and she majored in maths. Um, she was a part of the less than 1% of women in over 150 students in her course. She remembers questions aimed at her and the other women of the course, which were often easier, or jokes uh, at their expense, which were uh, they wanted to foster a friendly atmosphere. So they were making jokes at women. But this didn't hold her back. She became a math teacher and later the head uh, teacher of a middle school in Athens. Later, she had two children, out of which I was one. As you can see, uh, I was quite a geek ever since I was growing up. <laughs> I was given dolls to play with, but my brother's old PC seemed much more appealing. In elementary school, I struggled with the curriculum. While girls did art, I was the only girl sat with the boys in the computer lab. Later, I grew up. Uh, I was the first Greek person to receive the Google Anita Borg Scholarship and I founded the Women in Computing Society at my college. Later, I completed my PhD in computer science in 2014. <laughs> my daughter was born in 2015. While she was growing up, I made sure to develop her skills and creative thinking as much as I could. Way back in 2013, toys were at the crossroads. Those familiar pink aisles with the miniature household goods were gradually being, being replaced. Toys R Us removed references to gender toys from their catalogs. Even the women in the Lego world started to, to climb the career ladder one brick at a time. And she's here with us as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it wasn't just me who encouraged my daughter. Growing up in the second decade of the 2000s, schools had seized upon computing and technology crept into the classroom. From programmable whiteboards to the library using Kindles, technology was all around us. Um, by 2013, um, there were already many after-school clubs and initiatives which were backed both by the government and the private sector. The work of long-established organizations were, was further augmented by initiatives that wanted to foster a love for technology and that they wanted to enable um, students to make more, meet more like-minded peers. So by 2013, there were 17 UK-based and 53 US and Canada-based STEM initiatives, which focused on helping aspiring women. So this led to an increase in the number of female students that were receiving degrees in scientific disciplines. Even by before 2013, we can see an increase in female students receiving master's degrees in computer science. Um, by 2020, uh, US companies only needed 1.4 million computer scientists. 
my daughter's life into NT37 isn't the science fiction her grandmother may have thought. She doesn't drive a flying car to work, or she doesn't go by jetpack. She takes the hyperloop like the rest of your computers. Uh, for her, technology is everywhere. The Internet of Things is now a reality. Um, wireless connections and devices that are connected can transfer data with each other seamlessly and constantly. From the motion-sensitive alarm clock to wake her up when her sleep is at its lightest, to the milk in her coffee, which is always present in the refrigerator, because the refrigerator um, buys it for her. Climate control, self-locking doors, the core that changes according to your mood. For her, technology is all around the place. At her office, she belongs to a team which is located all over the world. They meet virtually over video conference. Although she tells me that even in 2037, uh, VC still break down and the meeting rooms are still not being booked. <laughs> um, so the seeds of this technical ubiquity were present in 2013. The most powerful mobile phone then was as more powerful than the most powerful of computers that was found in her grandmother's time. Tech companies were just starting to harness the possibilities of wearable tech. I'm not just talking about tech leaders. Um, crowdfunding has lowered the buyer for entry in R&D. The Leap Motion and Mayo has changed the way we interact with technology. RFID tags using the startup called Tile make us find lost items in our own house. Um, Self-locking doors, we use Lockitron, so all this technology can be left safely inside our houses. Notably, it was in the early 2000s that the stereotype of the geek was laid to rest. The rise of the geek seek uh, and the appropriation of tech as a, as a fashion item removed the, removed the stigma that was attached to the industry as a whole. Back in 2013, a party could not happen without a Facebook event, and the latter was not drunk without proof of it on Instagram. <laughs> in her grandmother's time, the heroines of women's rights uh, were historical. They were, the un they were the ones who literally fought, and in some cases died, for their equality. The rise of the early feminist movement in the 1960s has changed laws and culture. By 2013, we had recognizable female voices. Female CEOs were loaded in the press, even though they were still too few, and their gender was kind of a novelty. We had come through the storms of women liberation, and we were entering a process of normalizing. Uh, we wanted to, to have women having a say and a seat at the table. Uh, we were yet to reach the stage of pure performance, where women, um, where gender would not be important, actually. But even at the end of 2013, we were just starting to, to celebrate our female tech leaders. So in my life, I have been very fortunate. Other amazing women have paved the path for me. I no longer feel that I'm fighting, not in the way the suffragette did, and not even the way my mother did. I am very, very lucky. Um, for me, there is no fight to be fought, for it has already been won. Now, everyone needs to accept this. I'd like to make this path even easier for that hypothetical daughter of mine. But things are at the end perfect. Reality too often bleeds through my rose-tinted spectacles and creates a jarring effect. At a recent TechCrunch hackathon, um, two teams presented their ideas and they made international news for their stunning sexism and lack of awareness. But even there, there is hope. At the same event, there was a nine-year-old girl, girl called Alexandra Jordan that presented her own application. It was called superfuntime.com, superfunkittime.com. Um, it was a scheduler for play dates. She is now learning Ruby and HTML with the aid of her father. So the future, I imagine, is already here with us. I'm not asking for a grand gesture. I'm asking for a small change from everyone so that we can help normalize all the changes we've already been seeing. 
It was Wittgenstein that said that the limits of my language meet the limits of my world. I'd like us to stand on the shoulders of the women who have come before us and make a tiny semantic shift. This is not a call for, to arms, it's a call for allegiance. The audience here today and everyone who will watch this later on come from all walks of life and from all different professions. I'd like them to change, I'd like them and you and everyone to change the way we think. So maybe in the next job advert, um, the programmer can be a she instead of a he. Maybe the next amazing blockbuster movie uh, and the professional that is saving everyone from the alien menace can be a woman. Um, maybe you can look hard uh, to find female speakers for the next tech conference. Um, really good female speakers are still too few, but they are out there, so we should look out there and find them. And the novel everyone has been wanted to write, it can have a protagonist which is going to be a woman and the heron for generations to come. So my vision for life uh, in 2037 may not be a perfect prediction, but I hope you can get a small part of this future back to the present so that we can remember how to get there again one day. After all, the future happiness of my unborn hypothetical daughter and all your unborn hypothetical daughters relies on us. Thank you.